Hello and uh, welcome back to our special lecture series. My name is Tamur Khan and I'm an attorney at law. So today we are going to cover another important constitutional case, State versus Doso. But before I get to that, I would like to give just a quick rundown of the important turn of events that unfolded following the passing of the Governor General reference case up to the State versus Doso judgment. So in the highlight of the Governor General reference case was, as was held by Chief Justice Muhammad Munir, that an act which otherwise is illegal can become legal if it is done under the stress of necessity, the necessity being referable to the intention of avoiding and preventing the breakdown of constitutional machinery, of preserving the constitution. And this uh, uh, whole concept of civil or state necessity as such was taken from one of the addresses given by Lord Mansfield, who was again one of the the, the most eloquent jurists of his time. He was considered as the father of mercantile law and uh, he practically built the commercial law through his judgments. One of his famous slogans was that the law should follow the merchant. That it isn't that the merchant should follow the law, the problems that the merchant encounters. The law should be made in effect to address his concerns and so the law should follow the merchant. However, coming back, one of the interesting uh, uh, things about the, the reference was that though this reference which was sent to invoke the advisory jurisdiction under section 213 of the federal court was sent by Ghulam Muhammad shortly thereafter he fell sick and he was hit by uh, paralysis and so he had to leave for the United Kingdom for treatment and so in his place he appointed the then interior minister Sikandar Mirza to operate as the acting governor general. However, the acting governor general, through the help of some of the members of the constituent assembly, managed to have a successful coup and uh, deposed uh, Governor General Ghulam Muhammad from his duty, and so he became uh, a uh, sort of de facto, if you may, a governor general, and he would be the fourth uh, governor general of Pakistan. So now, when uh, Governor General Sikandar Mirza sort of took office, after the Governor General reference case, the immediate task was to summon the Second Constituent Assembly. And so one of the first things that the Second Constituent Assembly did was to legitimize some 38 acts which had earlier been passed by the Constituent Assembly through validity of Laws Act of 1955. Another step which it did uh, was on 30th September it passed a bill. And through this bill, the whole one unit policy was given effect to. You see, back in 1954, when the elections took place in East Pakistan, United Front got a whole lot of seats. And so this had been a, a huge slogan of the people from East Pakistan that they were not being given enough representation, that East Pakistan was being considered at parity with Punjab and WFP, Sindh and Balochistan as just one individual province. And so in order to make the constitution making easier, it was felt that maybe we can consider all the provinces within West Pakistan to constitute as one province. So West Pakistan would be one province and East Pakistan would be one province. So there would only be two provinces, two units. And so when the constitution of 1956, the first constitution was put into effect on the 23rd March 1956, it made the whole constitution a lot more simpler, that there would be just one National Assembly. There wouldn't be a bicameral legislature comprising of 300 members, 150 from East Pakistan, 150 from West Pakistan. There would be only two high courts, one of East Pakistan, one of West Pakistan. And uh, the, the system again was a federal form of government. Uh, but the simple system was made much simpler with this whole one unit policy, though at that time it was felt that this would address the concerns. And so with the promulgation of the first constitution, Governor General uh, took office as the first president of Pakistan under this constitution. However, the National Assembly was to be set up after holding of the elections. Now here is where the problem sort of uh, gave way that uh, elections were never held under the first constitution 1956 on so one pretext or the other they were being delayed and so now the date was given for 1958 but then it was again delayed the, the understanding was that elections would be held in 1959 and so uh, because of student protests because of other sort of agitation the military saw this also as an opportunity and martial law was declared in different areas and ultimately on 7th October 1958 Sikandar Mirza, the then president, 
through a proclamation annulled the constitution he dismissed the federal as well as the provincial cabinets he dissolved the national and the provincial assemblies martial law was declared all across pakistan and uh, general ayub was appointed as the chief martial law administrator now because the constitution had been abrogated so in order to have some form of uh, mechanism to some to have some form of law just three days after, on the 10th of October, the Laws Continuance in Force Order of 1958 was promulgated. Uh, the general effect of which was to firstly uh, uh, legitimize and validate all the other laws uh, in effect other than the Constitution of 1956 and to restore the jurisdiction of the High Courts and the Supreme Courts to issue their writs. And one of the important provisions of this law's continuance in force order was that Pakistan would be governed as nearly as may be in accordance with the provisions of the late constitution. Brief facts of the case were that there were certain individuals and they were accused of varying offenses including murder and criminal breach of trust. And uh, most of them had been convicted under the Frontier Crimes Regulation Act of 1901. Now under section 11 of this act, of this regulation act, uh, the district magistrate or the deputy commissioners had the discretion that he could refer a case to a council of elders or in other words a jirga to decide and they could return with a finding of guilty or not guilty. And then under section 11.3 of the Frontier Crimes Regulation Act, the deputy commissioner had the discretion. Either he could accept the finding or he could remand the case back to the same council or to some other council and then uh, pass his judgment of acquittal or conviction. Furthermore, there was another section 11 which was referred to where uh, this, these regulations were to be in effect only against the Pathans and the Baloch or any other class as the local government may notify. Now, the Frontier Crime Regulation Act 1901 was a, a special piece of legislation that was designed to uh, provide rather traditional sort of justice, apart from an insubstitution of courts of law, that there would be a jirga system in certain areas. And there were also certain special areas. And the Constitution of 1956 also went on to address those special areas that high courts and the Supreme Courts would not enjoy the powers of judicial review in respect of uh, these special areas. So now uh, these different individuals, they had been convicted, most of them had been convicted under the, the Frontier Crime Regulation Act and they had filed a writ petition against their convictions praying for writs of habeas corpus uh, as well as certiorari before different uh, high courts and uh, their argument mainly was that uh, this section 11 where the district magistrate or the deputy commissioner has the discretion or this policy of going only against the Pathans and the Baloch is not reasonable classification and so it offends article 4 and 5 of the 1956 constitution. Article 4 stipulated that every law, custom or usage having the force of law if it is inconsistent with the fundamental rights shall be void and article 5 followed that every person shall enjoy equal protection of law and that there wouldn't be any discrimination. So their main argument was that their convictions as such or the respective sections under which these convictions had been secured were ultra vires article uh, 4 and 5 and so on basis of this argument their convictions in most cases were set aside. And uh, against such uh, judgments, uh, criminal appeals had been filed which were heard by the Honorable Supreme Court uh, with the, under the Chief Justice Muhammad Munir and the central question there was that whether the writs which had been issued would they abate by virtue of clause 2 of clause 7 of article 2 of the laws continuance in force order of 1958. This was pretty much the central question. As the laws continuance in force order had come into effect that these respective appeals had to be decided in view of this new legal order. So now Justice Munir started off his judgment, he talked about and for the first time introduced the theory of Hans Kelsen who was another jurist. And so in his own words he said that when a constitution 
or a legal order is disrupted by an abrupt political change not within the contemplation of the constitution that disruption is in other words called a revolution now if it is unsuccessful the persons would be charged with treason if it is successful then a successful revolution or a coup d'etat is a recognized method under international law of changing a constitution and when that takes effect the validity of laws would be judged not with reference to the old order but to the new order because the old order ceases to exist and any sort of semblance is only secured or saved if it is provided so under this respective new order so chief justice munir said that uh, under article 4 of this new order all specific laws have been saved those which have specifically been listed but the constitution of 1956 has not been saved and since the fundamental rights article 4 and 5 form part of the constitution if the constitution has not been saved the fundamental rights also would not be saved because the laws continuance in force order makes it very clear that only those writs would issue if there is any fraction of the laws that have been provided under article 4 of the laws continuance in force order not under the previous constitution because as per Hans Kelsen that old order ceases to exist now there was another second question which was in relation to the question of abatement and so Chief Justice Munir referred to uh, article 2 clause 7 and which provides that if there is any writ or order which has been issued after the proclamation unless it is so provided under the order in respect of the laws which have been listed under article 4 that writ would own a loan issue as far as any other pending applications or proceedings then if they are not so provided then they shall abate so chief justice munir said that since the writs have now that the supreme court is hearing the appeals in respect of these writs so they are not final writs so nothing has been completed and since the high court has given certification of appeal they are still pending and would be classified as those pending applications as addressed under the respective clause 7 of article 2 and since they are still pending and sub before the supreme court they would as such abate forthwith and the interesting thing was that other judges amiruddin and Justice Sahabuddin and Justice Cornelius they didn't as such oppose this Han Kelsen theory they gave their separate notes but all of them were in agreement with the order which was given by their Lord Chief Justice Muhammad Munir uh, even though uh, Justice Seya Cornelius agreed with the order issued by Lord Chief Justice Muhammad Munir However, he did not agree with the reasoning given by Justice Munir and so he gave his own separate note outlining his own reasons as to how he reached his conclusion. He reasoned that the writs which had been issued prior to 7th October which was the date when the proclamation was made firstly that they should not be affected by this new laws continuance in force order of 1958 because if the writs had already been issued prior to 7th October uh, by virtue of examining article 2 of this laws continuance in force order he reasoned that there was no provision which would uh, give this whole order a retrospective effect so anything which had had happened prior to 7th October should not be affected and so to say or to suggest that uh, the high courts the power that they exercised of judicial review in seeing whether fundamental rights were being infringed notwithstanding the fact that the fundamental rights had now been cancelled the fact that this order does not have a retrospective effect those writs which had already been issued should not be affected on the question of whether they now abate by virtue of clause 7 of article 2 he had somewhat of a different uh, conception uh, in comparison to justice munir's analysis he said that where the article 2 clause 7 states that the writs which are not so provided to place construction that it necessarily implies to those writs which have been issued prior to 7th October proclamation was never the intention or would never be the proper meaning because the very instances where a writ is not so provided is already given under uh, respective article 2 of the laws continuance in force order and so he referred to uh, clause 4 clause 5 clause 6 where 
there were provisions which said that no writ should lie against the chief martial law administrator or against the deputy chief martial law administrator. So when the language which has been employed that the writs which are not so provided shall abate doesn't mean the writs which have been issued prior to 7th October, it only refers to those writs which already specifically have been expressed in that respective order. So now, despite of holding this, Justice A.R. Cornelius still nonetheless did not give the relief to those individuals. There was another second point. You see, he talked uh, in great detail, he discussed, he wrote about the Frontier Crime Regulation Act 1901. He said that there was a time when the British ruled from Bengal in the east to Khyber Pass in the west for hundreds of years and so they had to administer a whole large of area. Now some of those parts were as such regulation provinces and some were non-regulation provinces. So NWFP Punjab would be non-regulation provinces where they would be deputy commissioner. However in regulation provinces since they are, the people are living a nomadic life, there are no resources, it would be difficult to administer a, a proper courts of law system and jirga system is put in place. And so keeping in view those conditions, the Frontier Crime Regulation Act 1901 is a valid piece of legislation. As far as the concerns that the deputy commissioner or the district magistrate would have discretion whether he wishes to refer a matter to council of elders, he said that this discretion has to be exercised uh, in the form of a valid opinion. As far as the fact that this uh, policy of addressing or affecting only Pathans and Baloch, he said that this is a piece of legislation that had been passed earlier and has never been challenged. And so to say that it should now just be challenged on this point would again be uh, not a valid argument. So all in all, Justice A.R. Cornelius held that there is no violation of Article 4, 5 or any other fundamental rights with reference to the provisions which have been discussed under the Frontier Crime Regulation Act of 1901 and since there is no violation of the fundamental rights, he refused uh, to issue any writs and rather agreed with the opinion, with the order given by Lord Chief Justice Muhammad Munir, though he had different reasons. So we are going to uh, cut short our lecture here today and in our next lecture we are going to take up the famous case of Asma Jilani. So if there are any comments please let us know. Uh, thank you very much.